this mic? Yes. Okay. My name is Mystic. I'm going to be doing a presentation on mimicry and the mimic functions. Um, and in order to explain basically what that is, let me just start with this, the basic concepts, and then I'll give you, um, I'll give you an, I'll show you an example of the mimic functions in action, um, and then I'll go into more detail on how to use them, how to write your own um, things for them, and stuff like that. And then I'll give you an introduction to a program that I'm developing right now, still in development, um, that takes this concept into a live chat. Um, atmosphere. Um, yeah. Okay, so first, just basically, what is mimicry? Uh, mimicry is basically the ability to mimic your surroundings, as it says up there. So, you know, uh, like animals do it, um, like chameleons would do it in the wild to mimic their surroundings in order to survive. Um, and in the sort of cyberspace world where you have the internet and you have um, just communications going, going around, and you want to encrypt something, um, the problem with that is that when you encrypt something, if somebody could run a filter on that network looking for encrypted data and pull it right out, and then you know, eventually decrypt it, it's only a matter of time. You know? So what mimicry, what mimicry, um, what, what, uh, what mimicry basically does is it allows you to encrypt data or take any data and encode it in a way that the output does not look like encoded data. And in fact, it mimics the sentence structure or um, the sort of likeness of a completely different script. And I'll have to sort of show that to you. It's hard to explain. So that's what it says right there. A way to encrypt or hide data in which the output is statistically or grammatically sound. So if somebody was to use a, um, if somebody was to use a filter to look for it, it, it wouldn't come up because it would just look like normal text. Um, and before I go on, I want to show you an example of that. So just give me one second. Just sort of put it in perspective of what we're talking about. So here's a uh, Java applet. I'll give you, um, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you a, uh, an address to where you can actually download and use this program. Um, and the source code for this is also on the CD. Um, so basically, I want to enter the message here. Push from a create. And now what it, what it says there, um, basically what it generated is a block of text that mimics the um, mimics uh, two people. It mimics the uh, announcing of a baseball game. So I'll just read you a little bit of it. Uh, it. Says, "Well, Bob, welcome to yet another game between the Whoppers and the Blogs here in the scenic downtown Volvania. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that plenty of bubble off bog fever. It just talks about the game. So then, then taking this text." We can just run remove mimicry, and there's the original text right there. So that's basically what the uh, mimic functions do. Oh, and I forgot to mention um, the mimic functions were first released in a book entitled Disappearing Cryptography by a man named Peter Weiner. He was the first one to sort of take this concept and create a, um, a proof of concept, which are the mimic functions. So this is his code that I'm showing you. Um, and again, I'll, I'll show, give you a link to that of where you can go buy the book and his, go to his website. Oops. So now the question is, you know, how do you, how do you tell the program what to mimic? Um, and mimic does this by what it says, generating text using the syntax described in what's called a context-free grammar and hides the data by the choices it makes in that grammar. And I'll go through and explain that more in detail as I go on. Um, first, I'll describe what a context-free grammar is. Um, a context-free grammar is basically a very specific way of describing language in general. Um, 
And in order to do that, it uses terminals, which are words or phrases, and they're static, as it says there. Variables, which are places where those decisions, where decisions in the sort of phrase um, can be found, and productions, which describe how a variable can be converted into different sets of variable terminals. And I, again, I'll show you an example, which uh, puts it on perspective. So um, here you see a variable. So here's an example of a production. It shows a variable, and it shows phrases or words. So to describe, to show a concept discrete grammar on paper, you would have the variable, I think I, the variables are in bold, and then this uh, is what you put between the, the variable and the rest of the production, and then phrases are words. So um, this is a series of productions and describing a complete context free grammar. So this is a good way to describe it, okay. So you have start and a noun and a verb. Those are both variables, right? Start is where, is where you start. Nouns can either be Fred, Barney, or Fred and Barney. And the verb can be went fishing or went bowling. So this context-free grammar can generate sentences such as Fred went fishing, or Barney went bowling, or Fred and Barney went fishing, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically what a context-free grammar is. Um, Putting it very simply, because I don't want to get too technical um, into it, in, in order for Mimic to hide binary data, it creates a it creates a tree of choices based on those context-free grammars. So, if you look at here, there's all sorts of diff there's there's different choices that can be made. Uh, you know, the noun can either be either of these. So it goes to these choices and it creates a binary tree. So it starts. At, it starts here and it creates, it starts here and then it creates a one and a zero. Could either one could be Fred, zero is Barney, and then it goes on and on and on. Um, so when it creates this tree, the leaves of the tree is what would encode the right bits. So again, I'm going to give you an example so it's easier to understand. So we're going to start out with this context free grammar. There's start and noun and a verb, and then Fred and Barney, and then verb, went fishing, where, where is also a variable, uh, went bowling, where, those are variables, and then direction. So, you can see the bottom there, okay. Um, so, let's say, uh, da, 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 da. so let's say you, oh, there it is. So let's say you want to hide 1010. Zero, zero. Um, you want to hide those bits. What You want to hide those bits given this context-free grammar. So it's going to go through and say the first is going to start at start, and there's nothing hidden because it's just the start. And then so it's noun and verb. And since it's a one, it'll go to the first choice, which is Barney. And then it'll go on. Next one is a zero, and it's going towards Barney, verb, and you see the verb zero is going to be when fishing. So it'll go down when fishing. And then here it says uh, Barney went fishing where? It's a one. So it'll go to here, in direction Minnesota. So it'll go here and say went fishing in direction. So it'll say direction zero is northern. So it's northern Minnesota. And so that would give you the sentence down there if you can read it. It says, Barney went fishing in northern Minnesota. So, so Mimic needs the bits to be encoded, which can be the text that I entered at the beginning, which are converted into um, bits. And it needs a context-free grammar. Those are the two things that it needs to encode and also to decode. Um, and the way that Mimic understands context-free grammars is through what's called a grammar file. Um, and it's something that's unique to Mimic. Let me give you an example of a grammar file. Just really quick. As you can see here. I should have it up already. Uh, 
now. Really? Oh, man, I didn't know if you didn't... Ah, oh, jeez. Okay, well then, you know what? Here. All right, then I'll just go through this. You'll, you'll see an example as it goes on. Ah, oh, jeez, I did this again. Okay. Okay, well, in order to create a grammar file, um, in order to show the variables, variables always start with an accent, start with an asterisk, and must be one word. Um, productions are separated between uh, numbers and forward slashes. The numbers indicate the numbers at the end of the uh, at the end of the reductions, and I'll show you. There'll be a little bit of example. Indicate the weight given to that choice, and they. They're not. They're. They're not. Uh, they don't weigh out each other. Like just basically, the higher the number, the more probable it'll appear in the production. And I'll sh give you a better example of that. Uh, the end of variables indicate double slashes. Uh, starting variable is always one slash value first. So here's an example of what a small grammar file would look like. Um, AA start being it would always be alphabetically first. So that would be the start. Uh, Fred went to con. Con is a variable, um, and you see how it just sort of mim it's just sort of it's the same way as the context-free grammar looks, but it's done in this sort of grammar file format. Um, and then the numbers at the end give the weight. So here, this number is smaller than the other one, so this one would occur less in the final um, encoded information um, because of. Uh, the limitations of mimic, you, can never, you can't have a grammar that is ambiguous. So there can only be one way of producing one phrase. If there were more than one ways, then the encoding wouldn't work. So in order to do that, um, that's an example of an ambiguous grammar where there's more than one ways. Um, in order to do that, all, all, um, the, uh, all the reductions in a grammar file have to be in a certain format. Basically, it just means that the variables all variables have to be at the end of the reductions. You can't have a variable and then something static afterwards. It helps it. It helps make sure there are checks in the program to make sure that there aren't ambiguous grammars. But this helps out just to make sure. Um, some of the limitations of Mimic is that, as you saw before, I had a very small text and it generated a huge amount of data. Um, it 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 all depends on the number of possibilities in the grammar file. Um, and in that case, if there's only a few number of possibilities and each of the possibilities have a large amount of text, then you're going to generate a huge file um, because it needs more possibilities in order to generate a larger tree. Um, so also, if, if, you, if it reaches the end of a grammar file, it'll repeat and go back to the beginning. Um, and, also, uh, there's, and also, there's also randomness built in, but it's not sophisticated. So if somebody really wanted to, uh, they could write some sort of a filter to, if they saw enough data go through, they may be able to write some sort of filter because it's not, the, the randomness isn't very well done. It, you'll see some, you'll see one, you'll see bits that'll generate the same, uh, encode, the same encoded data sometimes, um, but there is randomness there. Um, IRC, IRC Mimic, this is the program that I'm working on. Um, it takes this idea of, of mimic, of, of being able to take a con uh, taking a grammar, a grammar file and generating text. But what, what my program does is I wrote a grammar file that mimics one side of an IRC conversation. Just a simple like, hi, how are you, uh, what's your name, where are you from, things like that. Um, and then it sends that to 
uh, any sort of any NIC that you specify. So it waits for a, it waits on the server for a connection. Um, it waits on the server for for that specific uh, nickname to message them. Once they message them, then the program will start send will send one side of the conversation and then wait for something else. And so you send another one, it'll send more of it. So and, it, and it's sort of it's built in a way that the end product will look like just any normal IRC conversation. But in that one side of the conversation is an, is an encoded message. Um, and in order to do this right, because you, you, that, that small text generates so much data, I, I um, did a few little tricks to get the maximum number of possibilities out of the grammar file. Um, and I didn't write down what I did, but what I did was basically for things like the uh, bot would say, you know, my name is. And the possibilities that I would use is I, would, I went on the internet and found like the sentence information for the top, I don't know, thousand names in the country and put that in as all the possibilities. Um, yeah, question. It's not that it's not that advanced right now. All it does is it generates. It basically it does the same thing that that first program I showed you does, but instead of generating the baseball game, it generates one side of a complete conversation. So, so it'll send that one. So, for instance, it'll say, "Hey," and then you type back the the person will type back, "Hey," and the com the computer will bring back, "How are you?" That's one side of the conversation. Then you'll say, "You know, good." The computer will bring back something random like, that's nice, you know, and then you'll say, how are you? And then the computer will say, you know, I'm all right. And, that, and those things, hey, how are you, good, and I'm all right, have already been encoded. That's, that's what it's sending. So I, I did, so the maximum possibilities, I think, did things like that. I also use common um, grammatical errors that people use in, in chat, uh, you know, like, um, like you know, using R instead of A-R-E, and, and I use you know, capital letters, lowercase letters, just, just to maximize possibilities. And I was able to, you're able to generate, like for instance, if you said like, this is a test, like I just showed you, that would fit in one conversation that's just maybe about uh, 10 lines long. So, um, so things, that, things to look at at the IRC. Um, if, you, if you want, the, this is still in development, if you want a copy of, of the source that I have right now, I don't have it on my website right now. Um, but if you want, you can come up and see me. I will, I'll give you a copy. I have it with me. Um, but there's other ways that you can go. I will have it on my website eventually, though. Um, there's ways you can go further. You could have two bots talk to each other. You could actually have two bots have the same grammar file and have actually conversations with each other and be talking about something relevant while they're actually sending maybe a third party some sort of encoded information. Um, you, can just, you can just add more to the grammar file, give it more of a, give it more options, possibilities, make it sound a little more real. Um, and here are some of my resources. This is where you can go, this is where you can go to, to uh, look at that, um, that uh, Java applet that I showed you at the beginning. Um, so also you learn about, uh, you can learn about disparate cryptography at, at www.wainer.org. That's Peter Weiner's website. Um, you should also check out Spam Mimic, which takes the mimic functions and actually you enter a message and it generates text that looks like a random spam message on the internet. So you know you could send that out and it, you know and, it, and you know somebody will. It's it's funny because somebody will read it and it just it, it doesn't really say anything. But if you keep on reading it, eventually you get bored. But it doesn't it doesn't seem like a computer is writing. It does really does seem like you know it's something that you'd actually see as a spam message. Um, this is a this is a place to go to get um, the original original mimic functions, which are actually written in C. Um, this is where you can go to get those. If you want the Java version, I do have it is on the CD. Um, yeah, it is on the DEF CON CD. Um, and the GIFs appearing cryptography. That's that the book is a second edition out. Um, IRC mimic. It's not up yet. Another thing, I'm a member of the Tribal Area Security Group. Um, and we'll actually be doing a talk tomorrow that you should check out on the uh, uh, box that we built called the, un the Undetectable Packet Sniffer, which is where we took a packet sniffer and stuck it into a uh, stock-looking uh, uh, un 
uninterruptible power supply box. It's really neat. You should go check it out. And that's it. I don't know if I have any time left for questions, but that's it.